Um, welcome, everybody. And actually, uh, Brittany, why don't you take down this amazing, beautiful graphic that has been flashing before us, uh, and we, we can go ahead and get get uh, uh, begin the meeting. So, um, hi, everybody. My name is Adrian Wren. I'm a project leader with Valley Vision. Um, really excited for all of you to be joining us today. Uh, I'm also staffed to the Sacramento Region's Clean Air Partnership Coalition, which is why we're all here. So uh, welcome to the fourth virtual luncheon of 2021. We're pleased to see all this interest in our region's current and planned transportation infrastructure projects and how we can maximize forthcoming funding from the federal infrastructure bill. To better understand who's in today's meeting, why don't folks uh, enter your name and your affiliation in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. So you guys can do that now. And while you're doing that, I can provide a little bit of background just for those who are new to CAP events. Um, the Clear Air Partnership was created all the way back in 1986 by the Sacramento Metro Chamber and Breathe California Sacramento Region, and Valley Vision began to manage it about 15 years ago. It's currently a broad-based partnership, which includes business leaders, environmental advocates, public health nonprofits, and our region's five air quality management districts, all working together to help the six-county Sacramento Region protect public health and promote economic growth by advocating for cleaner air. Um, so a, a big thank you to our event sponsors, the Sac Metro Air District, Tykert, SMUD, Sutter Health, Union Pacific, the Sacramento Association of Realtors, Placer County Air Pollution Control District, Yola Solano Air Quality Management District, El Dorado County Air Quality Management District, the North State BIA, PG&E, and the Healthy Air Alliance. Thank you. Um, a bit of housekeeping before diving in. This meeting is being recorded and a link will be shared with you all early next week. Reminder that you can always find recordings of Valley Vision hosted events on our YouTube channel. Uh, and actually, Brittany, if you're able to maybe drop a link to our YouTube channel for folks uh, in the chat, there's a ton of our, our diff videos from our different um, uh, meetings, events, uh, projects that we're working on. So check that out. There's a lot of really good content on there. Uh, and of course, as you've likely noticed, this is a Zoom meeting, not a Zoom webinar in order to be more interactive. If you have questions you'd like to verbalize, please use the raise hand function. Uh, depending on your version of Zoom, it should be either under the participants button or the reactions button. Um, those using the Zoom app on iPhone or Android also have this option. Uh, and then those of you calling in should just dial star nine to raise or lower your hand and then star six to mute or unmute yourself. And then of course, use the chat box for comments and conversations to take place. And I'll regularly elevate questions from the chat for you guys. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce Brittany Johnson. She's a Valley Vision Executive Associate who supports uh, our CEO, Evan Schmidt, and projects in our leadership and civic engagement impact area. Uh, and Brittany is going to be running the back end. Um, so Brittany, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Glad to be here. As Adrian said, I am the Executive Associate here at Valley Vision and glad to be on the call. <laughs> awesome. All right. So now, those of you who've been to our CAP luncheons know this process, but I always like to kick us off with a fun poll. So I'm gonna share this right now, uh, just as a little bit of an icebreaker. If you could time travel, where would you go? The past, the future, or the present? And gonna give folks about five more seconds to answer this. Five, four, Three, two, one. All right, share the results. That's crazy. That's like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Good job, everybody. 62 votes and pretty darn close between all three of those. So, uh, and I'm sure we could have a really substantive generative conversation about why folks might want to or not want to go to any of these specific points in time. So thank you for, for entertaining that poll. Appreciate it. Um, okay, so now let's dive into our subject matter today. We have, uh, we're going to be talking about important regional transportation projects planned and already underway, and how our region can maximize forthcoming funding from the federal infrastructure bill. Uh, so we have two experts with varied perspectives who look forward to exploring this topic. Uh, Christina Svensk, who's Director of Transportation with the Sacramento Area Council of Governments, or SACOG, and Autumn Bernstein, who's Executive Director of the Yolo County Transportation District. So welcome to both of you. And with that, I'd, I'd just like to hand it off to Christina first, who will share a little bit about her background and then begin her presentation for us. So take it away, Christina. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you for having me here. Um, very generous to call me an expert on this. I don't know if anyone is an expert yet on IIJA. Um, there's so much information coming out, which we'll go over. 
Um, but yeah, a little bit about my background. I started um, this new position with SACOG in August. So I am still what I would say fairly new and um, learning everything about all of you and your organizations and agencies. And so far it's been really great. So for those of you I've spoken with, it's great to see you on here. And for those who I haven't, um, definitely look forward to talking with you um, and finding ways to partner. Um, I am a Northern California native, um, grew up in the Bay Area. I have been in Sacramento for about three and a half years now. Um, I came from the consulting side um, and before that was on the public side uh, for a public transit agency. So have a pretty broad background um, that I think is, is a nice setup for SACOG. So um, Anyway, that's a little bit about me. We could go on forever about our backgrounds, but um, I want to share with you um, a little bit about what we've learned um, recently about the IIJA and ways that um, you know we can start to maximize it uh, in our region. So I'm gonna give everyone a few minutes to be able to see my screen. Um, Adrian, do you know if we can see it okay? Sure can, thanks. All right, okay. So um, just a few highlights first. Um, this was signed in to law November 15th, 2021. So this is still relatively new. In general, um, it gives about $550 billion in new federal infrastructure investment in public transit, passenger rail, bridges, clean drinking water, wastewater, clean energy, EV infrastructure. So all really important things here. Um, there are definitely big funding increases that we're going to see through formula programs, but really this is all about the competitive grants. Um, there are changes to existing programs um, that really focus on equity, climate, and air quality, which is super important. Um, and there's new programs and policies, but not for all modes. Um, one of the really interesting things is that it does include some funding and programs for road charge pilots which we know in California is something that we've already been doing as well as other areas in the nation. So it's nice to see that those things um, are, are um, being recognized at the federal level and the importance of them. So um, we hope to take advantage of some of that. So um, just a few changes to some key existing programs. There's a lot of programs and it would take up hours to talk about them all. So I just wanted to pull out a few. Um, so the Surface Transportation Block Grants, or STBG, is a big source of the funding that SACOG um, has for our funding round. So it's something that we're keeping an eye on. Um, there was a number of new eligible projects that were added um, during this bill. Um, one of the major ones was EV charging infrastructure, um, as well as protective features to enhance resilience. So from like a procedural perspective, sub-allocations of this funding will be split into some smaller ranges, but that might not affect us as much here. Um, and in rural areas, it permits California or any state to use up to 15% of the funds on non-federal aid highways in rural areas. So those are just some of the kind of key changes with STDG, but the biggest one I think is the EV charging eligibility of projects. Um, CMAC or Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality, another big funding source for us in the region um, through SACOG, um, added quite a number of new eligible projects, including shared micromobility, the purchase of diesel replacement vehicles, um, purchase of medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicles and the related charging equipment, um, as well as modernization of lock and dam or marine highway corridor connectors um, if certain criteria are met. Um, it also permits the use of CMAC for rail and transit operating assistance in association with certain CMAC projects located in certain areas. And that's sort of very vague wording um, at this point. On the equity side, um, it requires as much as possible the prioritization of disadvantaged and low income community communities when obligating funds to reduce PM 2.5 emissions. So that's interesting addition. Um, and then lastly, INFRA, um, it adds eligibility for multi-state organizations um, as well as, um, as uh, marine highway corridor projects that um, might reduce emissions. So um, new programs. Um, so there are formula and discretionary programs. 
So these are not all of them. These are just three that I wanted to highlight here today. So the carbon reduction program is intended to give funding for projects that reduce transportation emissions or for the development of carbon reduction strategies. So eligible projects under this program could be those like that might establish or operate traffic monitoring management and control facility or programs like truck stop electrification systems, ITS systems and capital improvements. Uh, certain public transportation projects, and even replacing street lighting and traffic control devices with energy efficient alternatives. So California is expecting about 553 million from this over a five year period, so about 110 million a year. Um, the PROTECT program is also new. Uh, it stands for Promoting Resilient Operations for Transformative, Efficient, and Cost-Saving Transportation. This is going to be both a competitive and discretionary, I'm sorry, a competitive and formula program. Um, so keep that in mind. So we're expecting about in California, $630 million over five years. Um, and there'll be about 1.4 billion available nationwide in the competitive or discretionary program over the five years. So the goal of this program um, is to help states improve the resiliency of transportation infrastructure. And lastly, there's the National EV Program. We in California are expecting about 383 million. Um, and this is designed to um, allow for the strategic deployment of electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So this eligible activity includes deploying EV infrastructure, establishing an interconnected network to increase reliability, access, and enhance data collection associated with the infrastructure. Um, one important thing to note is that projects under this program, it's only available for publicly accessible charging stations. So um, being along the designated alternative fueling corridors. So some new discretionary programs. This is a long list. There's even more on top of this. I'm only gonna highlight three of them um, here today that I think might be of interest to the group. Um, the congestion relief program is a big one, and that provides competitive grants for projects in large urbanized areas to advance innovative, integrated, and multimodal solutions to congestion relief in some of the most congested metropolitan areas. So the goals are to reduce highway congestion, um, economic and environmental costs related to congestion, and optimize existing highway capacity and usage of transit systems. So this money is available or this program is available to urbanized areas with more than 1 million in population and there'll be a minimum of $10 million uh, for the awards. So eligible projects might be um, high occupancy vehicle toll lanes, cordon pricing, parking pricing, congestion pricing, among some other um, projects. So as with many prog programs at the federal level, this would have a 20% match as well. Another one to highlight is the charging and infrastructure, charging and fueling infrastructure grant. Um, this is gonna have about two and a half billion dollars over five years for alternative fuel corridors, as well as a set aside program for community grants. So this one is about strategic deployment of the publicly accessible EV charging again, but also hydrogen fueling, propane fueling, natural gas fueling infrastructure along those fuel corridors. Um, and again, this is, a, is related to the publicly available um, infrastructure. And the last one I'll highlight is the local and regional project assistance program. This is tied to RAISE um, and they made a new local and regional program that enhances or emphasizes safety, sustainability and equity criteria. Um, this doubles, I think it about doubles the current RAISE program funding level um, and so as per the previous RAISE program, this is, you know, highway bridge projects, passenger freight rail, port infrastructure projects, and other surface transportation projects. Um, grants here are going to be limited to $25 million each. So what does all of this mean for California? So from a funding standpoint, this is what the state is estimating in some of these programs. These are very early estimates, so I assume that some of them may change over time. Um, we don't have regional level estimations yet, which is something that we will be working on. 
Um, but you can see it's a pretty, pretty significant amount of money that's going to be coming to our area that can really get some of these projects kicked off, which is great. So some takeaways here. Um, as I mentioned, there's significant opportunity for local and regional governments here, and we need to start kind of thinking about this and working together to um, get prepared for this money to come flowing. Um, in our opinion, what this really does is it brings federal spending priorities into alignment with what California is already doing. We've got CAPDI. We have a lot of other programs that um, have sort of pre-positioned us to be, to be um, in a good place for these programs coming out. But it does mean that we need to think about things a little bit differently when we're going through projects and evaluating projects and putting projects together um, for this funding. Um, you know, these things will still be subject to air quality conformity um, for federal guidelines. Um, but in general, we really feel like Sacramento as a region is ahead of the game. We've got the blueprint, which outlines a lot of things that, um, that put us in a good position. We're doing our MTP update right now, um, which is going to be taking a lot of these concepts, especially with CAPTI and equity, um, and putting them at the forefront. Um, and so I would encourage everybody, I, I was hoping to put a link into the presentation, but I, I wasn't able to, and I'll send it out, but um, would encourage everybody to kind of follow along our process with the MTP, and there'll be a lot of information that we'll be sharing throughout the process um, to provide comments or just understand where we're at and, and how we're approaching this to make sure that we're aligning with federal policies in the best way possible. So relevancy to some projects in the region, um, I'm sure we all are familiar with the mega region. Um, in SACOG, we have four projects that are part of the mega region dozen. We have the Roseville Third Track, I-5 Managed Lanes, Valley Rail Program, and the Yolo I-80 Managed Lane. Um, this is a really great map <laughs> of all of the four projects. Um, so I don't know how much detail we need to go into all these, but, you know, the Sacramento to Roseville third track is um, intended to increase passenger rail to relieve congestion along I-80. We have the managed lanes on I-5 as well as YOLO. Um, and we also have the Valley Rail project, which is going to bring more passenger rail service along the 99 corridor up into Sacramento and hopefully relieve congestion along those. So these are example projects of um, projects that could benefit from IIJA funding, both formula and discretionary program. Um, and so to kind of talk a little bit more about that, Autumn is here um, from uh, YCTV and she's gonna talk specifically about the I-80 uh, managed lanes project and where they're at and how they could benefit from this. Great, thanks so much, Christina. Hi everyone, I'm really happy to be with you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, say just a quick uh, word about myself by way of introduction, and then I'm gonna share some slides with you. So, uh, so as Christina mentioned, I'm the executive director of the Yolo County Transportation District. Um, I've, I have like, I think a few weeks less than Christina on the job. She started in August, I started in September. Um, I am also a Bay Area native, uh, although I went to UC Davis twice for both my bachelor's and master's, have lived in Sacramento around the region. Uh, but my background is primarily in the private and nonprofit sectors. I've worked as an advocate and a consultant doing intersectional work around transportation, housing, climate, sustainability, and, um, and social justice and equity issues. And so that's the background I bring to the role. Um, I'm very excited to be here at, at YCTD. If you're not familiar with us, we run the, of course, the Yolo bus service in Yolo County. Uh, and we are also the kind of overarching transportation planning agency for Yolo County. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about our 80 managed lanes project, kind of as a case study and thinking about how this kind of what I would say is a fairly dramatic shift in uh, the federal government's priorities around transportation, what it, what it means for that project as a kind of a test case for how we may think about other large projects in the region going forward. So with that, just give me one sec while I get my slides going. Okay. Great, can you see, see that? Them. Yep. Excellent. So, 
So the, the, I've titled this IIJA in Context, Envisioning a me Mega Project Through the Lenses of Climate and Equity. Uh, as Christina mentioned, climate and equity are two of the kind of key priorities that we see really elevated in the IIJA, I would say, compared to what we've seen in the past. There's a lot of other criteria in IIJA that I would say are more kind of conventional that we've seen for a number of years, but this is where I think we see the most dramatic shift. Um, and it's an exciting one, but it also you know, has implications for how we think about projects going forward. So um, Causeway 2.0, what would it look like to have an equitable climate-friendly YOLO I-80 Causeway? And this is the question that I think we at, at YCTD and our partners at Caltrans and SACOG are thinking about. Um, as we are currently in the process of developing um, a, a project that will really kind of fundamentally change um, uh, this important connection that really is a connection between the greater Sacramento region and the greater Bay Area region and runs through Yolo County. So what is it the project? It's the, the I-80 corridor improvement project is a partnership of Caltrans uh, with a number of different agencies that you see listed here. And it's, and it's a project Thanks. that is intended to Create hey, a set. Yeah. It uh, looks like your slides might not be advancing. We actually, we actually, oh, looked, no. yeah, it looks like we see the PowerPoint whole page. Oh, um, thanks for letting me know. Let me stop sharing and try that again. Yeah. Well, thanks if to Supervisor to Saylor. <laughs> if you need me to share, just let me know, uh, Adam. Okay. Thank you. I think I just probably shared the wrong screen. Um, uh, in yeah. fact, yeah, actually, Brittany, if you don't mind sharing, that would be great. Because I'm not cool. sure what I'm doing wrong here. Well, we can see it now. Looks great. Okay, perfect. Uh, so go ahead and go to the next slide. So um, uh, this is just a, a, an image just, just to illustrate. You know, this is, of course, everyone is familiar with the causeway, I think, here um, that, that crosses between, um, cro crosses the Yolo Bypass. And uh, we the project we're looking at is how, what does the next iteration of the causeway look like um, to really help uh, achieve, address some of the congestion issues we see, but also to do so in a way that is responsive to our climate and equity goals. Next slide. So uh, the formal name for this project is the 80 Corridor Improvement Project. Um, the lead agency is Caltrans and it is a partnership with, uh, with YCTD. Um, as well as a number of other agencies that you see listed here. Um, and the, the goal here, again, is to, uh, to create, a, to up to improve the, the Yolo Causeway and the 80 corridor in Yolo County in order to address some of the longstanding congestion challenges, but do so in a way that hopefully meets uh, some of our broader goals. Next slide. So the project area is really kind of county line to county line. Um, we're looking at the entire uh, corridor from the Solano County line in the west uh, and all the way across crossing the Sacramento River in the east, looking at primarily the 80, um, but also uh, some components of the 50, the 8050 interchange in West Sacramento. Um, and so the, the scope of this project is to really look at how do we improve this entire corridor. Next slide. So what are some possible project elements? Um, the, you know, a, a key piece of this is an additional vehicle lane. Uh, and I think a, a, a kind of a big question is, what is the nature of that lane? Is it a carpool lane? Is it an express lane? Is it a transit only lane? Um, or even potentially a general purpose lane, in other words, a mixed flow lane. Um, although we're not building very many of those in California anymore. So that's, that's one key component. Um, we're also exploring bicycle and pedestrian improvements uh, to the existing um, bike path. Of course, there is a current bike path on the causeway, but looking at how we make that a, a safer, more uh, pleasant experience and also looking at the connections on either end of the causeway to understand, uh, you know, how do we make it, uh, you know, again, looking at the entire corridor, how would we make it a safer, uh, more attractive option for people to, between West Sacramento and Davis. Um, intelligent transportation system elements, these are, these are things that like that, um, uh, that allow uh, for more rapid response to accidents so that when there's accidents, they can be cleared more quickly. Uh, for next generation vehicles, having more direct interaction where they can sense um, future kind of congestion or slowdowns. And then, um, and then also ways to kind of move things like ramp metering uh, and, um, and traffic signal improvements to try to make sure we can move all vehicles, but, uh, but particularly transit vehicles more expeditiously on and off the freeway. Uh, there's some discussion about whether or not we would want a new connector ramp at the 8050 interchange in West Sacramento. 
And then lastly, cut faster, more frequent bus service to utilize these new uh, managed lanes to enable more. Uh, there's already a number of buses that cross the causeway, including buses that are run by our agency, as well as SAC RT, um, uh, Fairfield, uh, and soon transit. A number of, of agencies have buses here, but those buses currently sit in traffic along with everyone else. And so how can we optimize this project for transit and also just get more buses running so that we have more and more people using transit to get across the causeway rather than driving. So um, there is a $86 million, there's a typo here, sorry, it's an $86 million infra grant that was awarded to YCTD and Caltrans in July of 2021, which provides a lot of funding for this project, but uh, we are gonna be look, look, looking for some additional funds to fully complete this project. Um, so we are well on our way um, environmental review is, is current, has begun. There was a notice of preparation that was issued in August. Um, and so we are very much underway in terms of making some key decisions about this project. Next slide. So how do we think about, again, going back to the IAJA's focus on climate emissions and equity, how do we think about emissions in the context of adding the lane? So, you know, clearly when you talk about adding highway capacity, we know that that has the, that will induce more driving. Um, that's kind of the point, right? We have some congestion and we want to address that congestion. So, so, but then how do we think about doing that in a way that, that minimizes the amount of new driving that is induced by, um, by the project? So the, the term here VMT or vehicle miles traveled, um, you know, is kind of a proxy term when we think about how, how are we trying, uh, how much tr driving is gonna be generated by a project. So this table comes from um, the I-5 managed lanes traffic analysis. The I-5 project is a little bit further ahead than we are. So uh, these are numbers not from the 80 project, but from the I-5 project that I just wanted to share because I think they illustrate some of the trade-offs. When we think about building a new lane, um, there are implications depending on what kind of a lane you build. So the first alternative, alternative 2 HOV2 is a carpool lane. And what we see is that using SACUG Saxon model, you know, we see that uh, 100, approximately 124,000 uh, vehicle miles traveled of induced demand with a lane like that. Um, alternatives three and four are, are um, hot lanes, meaning that, um, well, so alternatives three, four, and five are all basically variations of a, a type of lane where some users would pay a toll and some users like carpools uh, may, would either have a discounted toll or would ride for free. And so what we see is that HOT or express lanes induce less driving. And that's of course, because you have to pay to use the lane. Um, and then alternative six would be a transit only lane, which we see has a negative effect on VMT. In other words, it would have, would actually reduce overall VMT um, and then repurposing a general purpose lane. In other words, rather than adding a lane, taking an existing lane and turning it into one of these other alternatives. Also we see overall has a net reduction in VMT. So as we think about trying to minimize the impact of, on the climate of a new lane, you know, understanding these trade-offs between the different types of lanes, um, I think is a really important consideration and one that, you know, so far in the SACOG region, historically, all of our, our, our recent projects have all been carpool lanes. Um, there are not yet currently any express lanes in the SACOG region, but as we think about IAJA and, and this goal of trying to minimize emissions, you know, looking at toll lanes, may be a serious, um, something that we need to look at more, more seriously. Next slide. So what about equity? When we think about equity and, and the IIJ's focus on equity, what does that mean for a project like this? And I, I, I wanted to put this graphic in here because I think this is one that I think is really helpful when we talk about what's the difference between equality and equity. You know, on the top you see, oh, everyone here is given a bicycle of the same size, kind of regardless of their life situation. Um, whereas on the bottom we see that, you know, to, there's different kinds of bicycles that reflect the different needs that different people have. And so when we think about equity, there's really no one size fits all solution. It really need, is about kind of understanding who are the, the communities and populations who are vulnerable in the area that you're looking to serve and what are their needs. So some of the questions that we can think about are who would benefit from this project and who would be burdened by it? who would pay for it and how can some past harms be addressed? And so in the case of this managed lanes project, when we think about things like um, who would actually use this lane, for example, who's traveling, when we look at the low income populations in this, in this area, which are predominantly um, concentrated in West Sacramento, if we're looking just at Yolo County, you know, where is it that they need to travel? 
would they use the lanes? Um, you know, and are there burdens that they would experience as a result of you know, these, these new lanes? For example, construction impacts. We know that air quality impacts. There's already a lot of air quality issues um, in that area because it is the interchange of 80 and 50, and there's a lot of other kind of major uh, transportation corridors that run through West Sacramento. So thinking about the past harms in the sense that, you know, like many other low-income areas in California, West Sacramento has a concentration of major tra regional transportation infrastructure that has direct impacts on communities adjacent to that infrastructure. So when we think about what kinds of components we would want to build into the 80 managed lanes, how are we looking at past harms? How are we looking at um, not compounding those past harms, um, but rather uh, looking to ameliorate some of those and then this whole question of who pays is a really, really big one in transportation because when we look at the ways in which we've historically funded transportation, it's not always very equitable, particularly the reliance on sales tax measures, which we know tend to be regressive. Next slide. So to put this in context, I wanted to share some information from a project that I worked on just before joining YCTD. This is the, as far as I know, it is the first in Northern California. Uh, it's an a, a study of equity for an express lanes project. This is a US 101 ex express lanes project that is currently under construction in San Mateo County um, between Palo Alto and San Francisco. And uh, I was the project manager for a project to really evaluate what the equity impacts of these lanes would be and to recommend an equity program. Um, and so I just wanted to share a little bit because I think it's helpful to when we talk about equity it can be very abstract. And I just wanted to share some thoughts about how we might actually get more specific about thinking about equity in the context of highway projects. So um, the statistics on this slide are we, we basically did an analysis of, of low-income people in low-income geographies within San Mateo County along this project corridor to understand what their barriers to travel are. And so what we found is that there's an interesting split where about 12% don't have access to a car and are completely transit dependent. On the flip side, 28% of them said that congestion on 101 limits access to their job opportunities because they do have a car. So when we think about low-income communities, we need to think about the fact that some of them do drive and have cars and have invested in cars and, um, and there are and need solutions that work if you own an automobile. And there are also people who do not own a car um, and need solutions that work for them for people who are transit dependent or, you know, or bicycle dependent. Um, and I think that while these numbers are specific to San Mateo County, they're consistent what we see with statewide trends uh, in, in terms of a lack of safety, walking on biking on streets near highways, um, disabilities are higher amongst low income populations, lack of access to credit cards and bank accounts are an issue so that when we think about trying to kind of go to mobile payments, for example, or booking trips online, um, we need to recognize that not everybody has access to those tools. Next slide. So as part of this project, we did a literature review of trying to understand what was what, what was happening out in, this, in, in, the, in the academic world with people looking at equity and um, express lanes. And I'm not going to go through everything on this slide. It's very dense, although I'm happy to answer any questions folks have on it. But really what we see is that um, uh, you know, express lanes are... Um, a, one of the less regressive forms of transportation finance. Now, this may feel counterintuitive to, you know, if you're used to not having to pay for the freeway, at least when you get on it, it may feel like, well, how is it, how is it more, how is it more less regressive to, to now have to pay for a new lane? Well, the answer is because we are all paying for uh, freeways all the time. We're just not paying for them in direct ways. We pay for them through gas taxes. We pay for them through sales taxes. Um, and, and so the kind of the concept here is if you're actually paying as you go, then people are able to make a choice about whether or not it's worth it to them to use that infrastructure. Uh, and this is borne out by the literature. We see that, you know, high income earners tend to use express lanes more, um, than, than low income people, but we do see that, um, once express lanes are implemented, all group groups make, do make use of them when they need to. So it becomes a choice for people who may not, can't afford to use it every day, but when there's times when they absolutely do need to be somewhere on time, they value the option of having something like an express lane. So um, it's a complex picture about equity when it comes to tolling lanes, um, but there is, there is you know, evidence out there to, that, to support that this is a, 
can be more equitable, particularly when the revenue from the toll lanes is used um, to fund things like transit or to fund subsidized tolls for low-income people. So my next slide um, is just to share the final equity program that was adopted for the San Mateo Express Lanes. This was approved in April of this year. Um, these are the things that they have committed to doing as part of this uh, program. One is to provide free preloaded toll tags for low-income households in the project area. In other words, so that those people are getting free toll tags rather than having to pay for them and giving them some amount to make trips for free. The second is to provide cash value on newer existing regional transit passes. In, in the Bay Area, it's the Clipper. Here it would be like the Connect card. Again, so providing essentially cash for people on their transit passes for people who live in the impacted area. The third is enrolling low-income residents in regional discounted transit programs. Like we have, there's a program in the Bay Area called Clipper Start. And then the fourth, providing capacity to local organizations to educate and enroll participants. It's, there's no good having a program like this if people don't sign up for it. And, you know, transportation agencies don't do a great job of, of knowing who those people are. It's really local community-based organizations, social service providers that have the on-the-ground relationships with people. Um, so putting them in a position to let folks know about programs like this and enroll participants is really the best investment to make sure that you know, resources like this really flow to the people who need them the most. And then lastly, um, as funding allows implementing new express bus service that serves low income areas. For this project, they didn't have the funding yet because they wanted to roll out all of these strategies when the lanes open, but they anticipate that over time, as the economy recovers and as, you know, traffic rebounds after COVID, that down the road, they would be able to implement some new studied bus service that basically connects low-income neighborhoods along the corridor, uses those new express lanes, and takes them to, like, BART stations or job centers in San Francisco and elsewhere. So, again, just an interesting case study that, you know, that I happen to have worked on that I thought was interesting and relevant as we think about this conversation. Um, next slide. So just to wrap up, um, in summary, you know, the IIJA prioritizes equity and climate more than we've really ever seen before from the federal government. Uh, and that means for highway projects like the 80 managed lanes, we may need to up our game to be competitive for, the, for that funding. Um, we're not used to really building, I would say, highway projects with an emphasis on climate and equity. The CAPTI um, program that is now being implemented as well as laws like SB 743 have started to move us in that direction. Um, but this is still a pretty big shift um, for, for local and state transportation agencies to really to kind of more fully embrace some of these uh, concepts and to think about how we make our projects, you know, uh, more consistent with, the, with climate and equity. And so I'll just, I'll end there. I've got my um, email addresses here and I see there's been a lot of conversation in the chat. I, and I apologize, I haven't been able to follow, but happy to answer questions. And Adrian, I guess I'll let you MC. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Autumn. This was a fantastic presentation, Christina as well. Um, so we have a couple folks who've raised their hands and then we have questions in the chat as well, but I'd like to go, I think to Dan Allison first and then Chris Norum uh, who have their hands raised. And again, reminder to raise your hands or add questions in the chat. Thank you for the presentation. Um, some comments and questions. Uh, first, the bike path needs to be separated from the freeway uh, for pollution and noise issues. The path that's there currently is unacceptable and there's really nothing that could be done to make it acceptable experience. So it needs to be separated. Um, if this is really a corridor study, it needs to include consideration of increasing capital corridor service um, because that's the other thing in the corridor that provides service between the three cities um, or two cities and it needs to be considered. And lastly, any project that allows better transit service um, should also fund that transit service. Um, we can't just make a transit lane or uh, make um, manage lanes that are usable by buses if we're not funding bus service. There needs to be frequent service between Sacramento, West Sacramento and Davis. Thank you. All right, Chris. Uh, hey, <clears throat> excuse me, thanks. Um, I'm curious, um, how does this project uh, work in terms of implementation? Because you're the YOLO transit agency, but you're talking about changes on a 
you know, interstate highway. Is Caltrans doing it? Or are you doing it in coordination with them? And secondly, my other question was, um, you know, what's the, I know people love alternative transit and YOLO buses and bikes. What's the transit ridership rate um, in YOLO uh, currently on buses compared to what you hope it might be? Great questions. Um, we, uh, the, the, the project, Caltrans is the lead agency on the project. YCTD is the recipient of the $86 million infra grant. And so we are a, a, a key partner with Caltrans um, in this. And so we're really working, as well as SACOG, which is also has provided some of the planning funding for it. So it's really a partnership. Uh, UC Davis and the cities um, in, in Yolo County are also all involved. Uh, there's a steering committee that we all sit on uh, that, you know, provides input, but ultimately at the end of the day, uh, Caltrans is the is the lead agency on the project. Um, with regard to uh, with regard to our rider y Yolo bus ridership, um, we do have we we have a number of lines that use the causeway currently. We have our Route 42, uh, which runs both directions, which is our uh, the kind of semi clockwise and counterclockwise loop uh, between Yolo County cities, you know, Woodland, Davis, West Sacramento, as well as city of Sacramento and the, and the airport. That is our highest performing route. Uh, and I'm, I apologize, I'm not someone who can keep ridership numbers in my head, um, but I'm happy to look them up and put some in the chat. Um, we are seeing, you know, ridership, of course, fell off a cliff um, along with everybody else's during COVID. And we've seen it, you know, rebounding fairly dramatically. I think we're getting to within about 80% of pre-COVID levels in the last couple of months, particularly with the university reopening. Um, and we also operate the Causeway Connection, which is a partnership with SACRT, uh, which also uh, moves buses back and forth across the Causeway between UC Davis campus in Davis and then the UC Davis campuses in, in Sacramento. Wonderful. A reminder to raise your hand if you'd like to vocalize anything, but I was going to dig into our chat, which again has been pretty active, uh, just elevating um, Tom Stollard's, uh, Mr. Woodland right here, uh, Tom Stollard's uh, comment that we really do, I know, you know, IIJA is a common acronym, but it stands for um, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, also known as the Infrastructure Bill, so that's what we're talking about, the Infrastructure Bill. Um, so thanks, Tom, for that reminder. Uh, Deb Banks was just elevating, uh, you know, that there really needs to be a full bike trail throughway from West Sac to Vallejo, um, largely, largely considering e-bikes and the rise of e-bikes and the possibility of longer trips um, between here and there. Uh, Dale Steele, better bike path barrier, sound protection is also needed. Susan Rainier, um, bikes and pedestrians need to be somewhere else, not necessarily next to a major freeway where there's air quality and road noise, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, also uh, additional comments from Jim Lerner uh, on the need to separate the bike and ped paths um, for safety reasons, probably you know, for other reasons too. And then pa Paul, Philly, I don't know if you're able to unmute yourself, but you had an interesting comment about, oh, you raised your hand, perfect. Why don't I call on you then? You can <laughs> explain kind of where you're coming from with this. And yeah. Sure. Uh, Paul Philly, Sac Metro Air District. Um, we commented on the NOP, I believe. I hope we did. Um, but um, for those of us who, who took some transportation engineering courses, uh, a single freeway lane uh, operating by itself usually carries about 1,600 vehicles per hour. And when you stick two of them together, each of those lanes goes up to 2,000. Um, so having a, a three in one, which is what is almost always proposed, we've got three lanes, we're going to add another, and it'll operate by itself. If you convert one of the general purpose lanes into a managed lane, you're actually increasing the capacity of the corridor and you're having a hedge against congestion because now you have two lanes that you can either toll or carpool or something. And it, it, it provides resiliency for the transit users or the bus riders, the carpoolers, um, or the people who need to get to the airport right now. Um, so there's um, a resiliency piece that, that I'd like um, YCTD and Caltrans to, to take a look at. Thanks for that. And it's a good point. I appreciate that. Uh, let's go to Naila. Hey, Adam. Hey, Naila. <laughs> I'm not sure if this question is for you, Autumn, or if it's going to be for you, Christina, but um, how does the decision by the Department of Labor, um, you know, like the 12 billion that we hear is being held up because of labor negotiations, how is that affecting any of like the plans that you guys are talking about? 
I'm going to see if Christina wants to take that one because I'm not the PEPRA expert. I am <laughs> uh, also not a PEPRA expert. Uh, I, I just had a few discussions about it this morning. Um, I, I, I think what I can share is that we're hopeful that things are going to go the way of our transit operators and not hold up that money anymore. I, I, I don't know what from a regional perspective, the true implications would be. I think there's some precedence there that um, this shouldn't really affect us based on previous rulings, um, but we're still kind of wrapping our heads around, around what this all means and how it's gonna shake out. So I wish I could give you a really good strong answer, but I think we're still figuring it out too. But I, I, I think staying up to speed um, just generally with what you see coming out or reaching out to me. I think if you want to, um, I can share my email address in the chat. I'd be happy to, to talk with you a little bit more offline about it. I'll put my email address in the chat as well. Um, I, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I wish I had a better answer too. <laughs> Makes me feel better that Christina doesn't. Yeah, and fun fact, Naila, current executive director of Climate Plan, uh, is here with Autumn Bernstein, who is a former executive director of Climate Plan. Uh, so, wow, fun fact. High five, Naila. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, small world. Um, <laughs> so, uh, wanted to just continue through the chat. Again, please raise your hand if you want to vocalize anything. But uh, Tom Stollard was agreeing with Susan that we need to put the route at grade in the bypass. And then Tom, you also recommend the possibility of putting a bike lane underneath the whole the whole piece of infrastructure, which I think is kind of a cool idea. I don't know if you want to go into any of that, uh, but it <laughs> seems interesting. <laughs> and then and then uh, Deb Banks, uh, and, and actually this might be a question for uh, Autumn or Christina, but she believes some of the current plans are for the causeway to actually be away from the freeway. And I think I remember hearing something about that too. Do any of you guys know what the situation is there. I want to let Tom go first and my board member, and then I'm yeah. happy to answer some question, question about that. I'd just like to say how fortunate we are in the region to have Autumn joining us at YCTD, Yellow County Transit District. She's a star. Uh, I just was noticing as we looked at that slide of, of the bypass, how tall those concrete columns are well above any potential flood level. I mean, it'll be water will be going over the levees before it gets up to that roadbed. I, I just thought we could essentially route the, the bike lane underneath the traffic lane suspended between those concrete columns. I think it's something that could be considered as an option because I only rode that thing once on a bicycle and it was awful. It is, it's no, very noisy and obviously you're breathing exhaust the whole time. Thank you. And just to respond to the question about some of the earlier iterations of the project, it's true that earlier, and again, I was not around for the, his, the history, but as, as what my understanding is that uh, we've applied for infra, a grant for this multiple times. Earlier iterations did include a larger budget, which would have allowed for a fully separated brand new bike path uh, uh, over the bypass. That's not part, the, the funding amount that we received um, in, in the current infra grant is nowhere near what it would take to do that. Um, so currently the current project, it's not currently on the table for this project, um, but, uh, but that doesn't mean, that's not to say that it couldn't be back on the table also, but, but I think kind of more relevant to the question of a, of a, of a, of a new bike path across the bypass is um, we did also just recently receive another $1.2 million raise grant to look at a network of inner city uh, bicycle and pedestrian trails here in Yolo County. Um, so that's another grant that we're very excited about. And that, um, you know, that will, we will be working with communities to look at what are the priority, where are the needs for uh, additional um, bicycle and pedestrian tra trails to connect rural communities and our cities. And so, the you know potential, but that could be one place where we could look at a, a new a new bike route across the causeway connecting some of the communities. And it really does seem like a lot of this is still malleable, right? Which is good. So um, thank you for that. Uh, looks like Chris has her hand raised. Go ahead, Chris. I do. So I've got to jump in here in my role of being a member of the Yolo Basin Foundation Board. And just remind everybody that that whole area of that causeway is going across a federally protected wildlife reserve. 
So anything that we do has to be carefully balanced with what it is endangering in our birds that are living there. You know, you all may not realize that in this drought year, the Yellow Basin Foundation has the oldest water rights in the region. And up north for us, many of the wildlife preserves don't have water for the for the birds, migrating birds. And we do. So we're actually having more birds this year than we normally do stop. Which if you live close to the causeway, like I do, is why you're hearing so many booms in the early morning because duck hunting season's open. Um, but not only that, but now we are diverting salmon through the, the wildlife region. We have the bats that are nesting underneath there. So every little thing that we do has a giant ripple effect. And one of the things that we don't really think about a lot is those areas like Nags Ranch and like the Yellow Basin Foundation are also greenhouse gas emission sinks. And they are helping us to maintain some balance in our region. So I just got to say all those. And if you're not a member of the Yellow Basin Foundation, please hit our website, join. I see Don Saylor's here too. So, um, you know, we would love to have you as members or bring your kids out or come out and see our birds. Hey, Chris, while, while we have you unmuted, uh, I know I saw you responding to another question in the chat from Nicole. Uh, so she was at, and just wanted to kind of make this clear for folks. So Nicole was asking, do you see the competitive nature for extra funds affecting the quote normal funds that are being distributed via these formulas and, and don't have conditions that'll result in aligning our climate and equity goals? And I, I think you had a response to that. I did. So with the, the new administration, every bit of federal funding, and I don't care if it is for a roadway or for a workforce development program or putting an air conditioner on your house, it has four things that it needs to meet. And that's competitive grant money and state formula grant. It has to show greenhouse gas reductions, which is pretty common. It has to be able to show that you're creating jobs, sustaining jobs, and not displacing workers. The third thing it has to show is, and these are two uh, on the side of the same coin, is you have to show that you're building capacity in a local community. And that is really fuzzy right now. There are work groups at the federal government that are meeting to understand what that means. But as you all know, we had this period of development decades ago that ran freeways between communities and separated folks and we created these bad pockets. So now what they wanna show is first that you're gonna do no harm and second that these things are going to restore those communities that were previously disruptive. Um, however, that is so subjective, they are trained to come up with some specific ways to measure that. So, but that will be true for every bit of federal funding for the next five years at least. Yeah, so, thank Autumn, you. haven't met you yet. You know, like to have you come out. Hope to get together. Yeah, happy, I, happy to come talk. Yeah. Yeah, Chris is Chris is a, a hydro a, well longtime hydrogen expert, and I'm sure she'll have. I'm sure there might be some opportunities with some of these projects for that too. So, <laughs> and batteries have actually expanded now. I love anything that's not gasoline or diesel. So. All right. Wonderful. So again, remember to, to raise your hand uh, if you have questions. Um, just wanted to note Susan agreeing with many of us that the I-80-50 split is, quote, dysfunctional. Um, from Glenda, just kind of elevating the concerns about flooding that, that we do see with the causeway. Um, uh, both Ralph and, and uh, Alberto, Dr. Ayala, uh, also note that hey maybe a, an under uh, an under highway bike lane might be might be better for you know pollution exposure um, and then what else do we have here Yolo County has an ag charter and the Yolo Basin is a federally protected area okay thanks Chris I think we were just talking about that uh, bike ferry system not sure what that might look like but that's kind of a cool idea too. Um, and then Autumn, it looks like you pasted in the chat an equity, the San Mateo equity study. So is that pretty easy to, does that include some of the stuff that you shared earlier? Yeah, that's just for anyone who wants more information about that project and the, and the, the strategies that I shared there. Um, and then I think I also put in the Caltrans, um, the, web, the website for the Yolo 80 managed lanes where you can keep up. It's the Caltrans um, website where they kind of post updates and notices. And if you want to stay in abreast there, I think there's a way you can sign up for, um, for their distribution list. And you can also reach out to me as well, because obviously we're very involved as well. And one thing that Chris mentioned was, you know, one of the four pillars being really, really the need to 
and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, on kind of interpreting this, but like the need to engage like neighborhood folks, uh, local folks in, in this work, was that one of the four pillars that you talked about? You know, that's part of that fuzzy one about building fuzzy. capacity. Uh, and one of the things that I have heard them describe is to say, uh, in so many programs before, we've said, let's come in, let's create some jobs, and that program dries up and goes away, and those jobs, jobs dried up and went away with it. So um, instead of, let's use highway construction as an example, we bring in all of these people when that highway is constructed, where do those people go? Uh, you know, do they all pack up and move to another state to build another freeway? So it is, as we are building things, we have to look at all of the systems around that. And that could come down to the fact that we are creating jobs within a community that doesn't have affordable housing and is in the middle of a food desert. So what are the other things that we need to do to really make that a place where people have durable jobs and makes a lasting impact and has an overall positive impact in the community? And uh, as I said, that's going to be really challenging because what that means to me means something different to Evan and something different to Tom and something different to Sarah and then it's going to mean something completely different to people who are sitting in Washington DC and looking at our projects because they don't know about our bats and salmon you know so no answer yet <laughs> great well we have a, a, a lot of neighborhood leaders here with us today uh, so maybe just something for us to be thinking about Looking at looking at uh, Raymond, Angela, Naila, Richard, etc. So and and many others. Um, I you know I, I see Chris Flores's comment here. Hey Chris, is this with regard to Naila's comment, the PEPRA, or is this something else? I'm not. Yeah, I'm not Pe familiar. PEPRA. It's the Public Employee Pension Reform Act that was signed by Jerry Brown back in 2013, and so that that's the issue that she was referencing with the Department of Labor, and it, it's a it, it's complicated and has long uh, history of litigation, but essentially um, the Biden administration has reversed the Trump administration um, determination that PEPRA violates um, 13C of the Federal Transit Administration Act, which requires that um, essentially all federal grants have to go through DOL for certification for transit, and they have to make sure their um, collective bargaining rights are violated. And so essentially the DOL has said that it does violate um, the, the rights of transit workers. And so that's been through litigation. <clears throat> I will add that SACRT in the rede redetermination letter has a, um, excuse me, a footnote that um, will include injunctive um, relief based on a previous court decision. So it's still unclear, but I think we'll see with this stay, which will most likely be granted. Um, next week. Gotcha. Yeah, thanks for that clarity. And I see that Christina agreed with you, so that's good. <laughs> um, can, so again, continue to continue to raise your hand. Um, going through some additional comments, I see Supervisor Sailor. I don't. I, I actually can't read this. <laughs> There's a lot here. Do you want to give us the two sentence summary of this? <laughs> Thanks. This is an ongoing conversation that, that we're all having on this on the I-80 uh, managed lane project across the causeway. And it's as it, it is a bigger, it's part of a bigger picture. It goes, it's the corridor all the way from say Vallejo uh, up through the Sacramento region. So there is a larger lens that's being looked at. The the portion across the causeway, the bike issue, bike and pedestrian issue is is an interesting one. This is a bypass, it's a flood safety bypass that's designed uh, to serve a specific purpose, to protect the, a million people or more who are, who are in danger of, of floods if it's not there. So it's got to work as a, as a flood bypass. It's also a habitat conservation area, as Chris White has mentioned, and it is a, a rice growing area, it's very productive. So in the, Yolo County for decades has been working to protect the, the Delta and to look at how we can manage that facility for these multiple purposes. It's very challenging to add an additional standalone facility because it interrupts, uh, it has impacts on, uh, on, on all of those existing areas. So it's the environmental habitat and agricultural impacts uh, would be very significant. 
doing something on the existing facility, whether it's under it or beside it or improving how, how, the, how the current facility functions uh, is, is really more promising than uh, looking at doing a separate facility of some sort. Even though uh, it, uh, it would be appealing for many, it would be a, a very costly matter uh, and it would also be a high impact uh, concern. The current proposals that, that are under that are uh, in the in the package that we're looking at now uh, basically improve the separation on the same facility for bike and pedestrian. Uh, I, and whether those are working for, I think some of the comments that have come out so far uh, is, is an open question. But it is a it's going to be a challenging matter uh, to uh, to look at this uh, in any in any way. I really agree with the comment that's come out about, about uh, making this an overall corridor uh, assessment and finding ways to improve the capital corridor uh, service between in, throughout the region. And we're doing several investments at the Davis station and a third rail between uh, Roseville and Sacramento to help to increase the, the, uh, the, uh, the, take, the, the take rate, the passenger rate on the capital train capital corridor. I, I'm currently a member of the Capital Corridor Board, as well as Yolo uh, County Transportation District Board. And these conversations have never been more exciting than the possibilities of, uh, of funding this year and the great leadership that, that Autumn is showing. I think we've got some really interesting opportunities. Yeah, thanks for that. And I'm sharing the uh, map that Chris put in the chat. I've never thought about the causeway like this. <laughs> this is a lot more. You know, I, I think that's the thing, and I was chatting with a couple of people privately too, is that what we can literally see from the causeway is up to that first little area where you see um, where it says like Rice Point. That's the part that you can see from the highway. And when you think, oh, just build something else and go around, you know, around the backside, because we've been talking in West Sac for decades about building a second bridge to for truck traffic. You have to go almost all the way out to the Delta before you are out of the wildlife area. It is a really huge area that you don't see from the road. And there are all sorts of critters that are living back here in the back that if you don't uh, go out there and walk or drive all the way out to that furthest parking lot, you never even see some of those amazing hawks or the otters that live out there, or the other things. So uh, everybody more knows than just a place to cross. Yeah, it's I'm more sorry. than just a place to cross. It's an actual place unto itself. So everybody, take your kids out there this weekend. It's free. Go look around. Hey, I have a question. Um, whoops! If you bring that back up, sorry, Adrian. Sure um, can. Uh, <laughs> At the kind of just between the train tracks and 80 at the top, there's a bike. And is that a dog at the very top you there? Know, what, what does that mean? It, that's actually a cow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the worst looking cow, but that's actually a cow. That's cattle grazing area right there. Um, we, we actually can't have any dogs or horses in the wildlife basin area because A, they scare the birds and B, they poop out things that are not native. And then what's the deal with the bike in there? Uh, that is actually kind of showing the bike path that's on Highway 80. Okay, got it. Yeah, that, that, so, I was like, that's, that seems kind of odd to me, so. Yeah, see, there's, there's currently no bicycling allowed in the conservation area either. Even though there are trails for walking and driving, there's no bikes allowed because of the disturbance of the birds. And uh, this time of year, too, a lot of the birds are nesting in the grass. And if you get off the trail, you run the risk of stepping on eggs. Gotcha. <clears throat> and just to add one more thing on the, 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 the comment about the Capitol Corridor, you know. Um, Updates. Christine. Family oriented event, come out. Oops, sorry. I, I just wanted to add one thing, you know, Christina, about the Capitol Corridor. Christina mentioned earlier when she was looking at the list of mega projects that third track between Roseville and downtown Sacramento. That's an incredibly important project, not just for people who live between Roseville and Sacramento. It has impacts for the entire Capitol Corridor um, and for being able to increase the frequency of trains and, um, and really just kind of continue to up the, you know, the, the frequency and reliability of the service on the Capitol Corridor. So I just wanted to flag that as, as really critical. Yeah. And we have, we have, 
Go ahead, Christina, and then uh, Jim. Yeah, I was just going to, I was going to second that. I mean, that's a project that kind of gets lost sometimes. I see Jim Allison is on here. Um, <laughs> um, we're, we're really excited about, about that. I mean, we all know that I-80 is um, one of our, our major corridors that we need to understand how we can fix. Um, and rail service is going to be one of the big ones. And it, she's spot on. It's not just about the local, even, you know, super regional connections here in Sacramento, but as someone who used to take Capital Corridor to San Francisco on a regular basis, it's well used. It's a very important part of our infrastructure spine here, impacts what we do at the local level with transit connections. So um, we're excited to see that progressing a little bit more too. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I just wanted to really thank the Sacramento region as a whole and the, all the support that's been provided. Um, we are luckily on the home stretch of a full funding plan for the phase one project, which will be the additional two round trips. And so um, I hope I don't have to do any more funding for that phase. I think it's, it's, uh, it, it's hopefully, uh, all queued up and ready to go. Where we will need funding and support is to expand that service up to 10 round trips. And uh, we uh, are looking forward to kicking that off as soon as I know that the ball is rolling down the hill, you know, the energy is going towards that phase one. So um, Roseville is excited about it. Placer County is excited about it, lots of support. So I, anyway, this is almost a way of thanking so many people on this for the support and the support letters we're getting um, we just need to translate that into a few uh, wins on our federal grant application for Chrissy and uh, look for more funding out of this infrastructure grant for the next phases. So thanks. And Chrissy is a funding program, not a person. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'm so used to saying it, but yeah, it's a nice acronym and we'll, I, yeah. I think I don't even know what the acronym is, but I know it's Chrissy is important. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, and, and quick comment, maybe for Jim, because uh, because we've been talking about Capital Corridor, we've been talking about Third Track. One of the, the the barriers I think that some folks talk about to to uh, some rail services, just like the cost of the tickets, is there opportunity as these programs come online and through some of this new investment to like rethink maybe some of the pricing structures for that to get more folks taking it. Um, definitely. And that's already been happening. We're working, we're the fiscal sponsor of the California Integrated Travel Project. And that is going to, um, and we're going to be doing a pilot project and it will be using contactless EMB cards or your smartphone to make payments as, as opposed to going into the Amtrak system and buying a ticket. And it should make our costs so much lower for ticketing and give us more control over our ticketing rather than being tied to the Amtrak national system. Um, so we're rolling that out. It's a very complex thing to, um, you know, it's like replacing one set of lungs and everything with a whole other system. So we have to get that working in, in uh, parallel for a while, but that's gonna offer a chance to, you know, bring more affordability and also the eligibility aspects that CalITP is working on, such as age-based discounts. Um, they're working on connections to the DMV so you can register and not have to have the burden of as a transit agency going right to your, going down to headquarters and saying, here's my birth certificate and now I qualify. It's a more of a statewide um, global registry. And so they're looking at other aspects, um, which would be eligibility because of qualifying for affordable uh, housing or food assistance, those kind of things. There's many opportunities digitally to link uh, those discounts and thus make a, for a more equitable experience, uh, ticketing experience on the Capital Corridor. Because I think the, the fares are a barrier for so many, so at this point in time. Thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Um, going to do a quick last call for questions before we move on to uh, another exciting um, uh, announcement discussion. Going once, twice. All right. Well, and thank you all, you know, for participating in that, that discussion just about a really, really important uh, <laughs> part of our region that we all, that we literally all use. 
Uh, so, so I'm really interested in kind of the next steps on that and then how, you know, to, I see to Richard's point, you know, how uh, communities can engage in this kind of planning process, which can be sometimes be uh, not super accessible. Uh, and I, I really appreciate both Christina's and Autumn's sort of emphasis on, on equity, on trying to have a, a really meaningfully community engaged process through all of these projects. So um, exciting stuff and, and we'll continue to kind of advance these conversations as best we can. Um, wonderful. So uh, I'd love to, to now turn it over to uh, Valley Vision CEO, Evan Schmidt, who uh, has something to say about a, a really new and exciting opportunity to do highly local yet regional uh, community and economic resilience planning. Go ahead, Evan. All right. Thanks, Adrian. And hi, everyone. Great to see you all. And I'll just spend a moment reflecting on the causeway because as someone who lives in Davis and works in Sacramento, I'm very familiar with it. And I've I've biked it, I've taken Yolo bus across, I've most often I've driven it, uh, and I've actually spent a lot of time at the bypass uh, watching birds and watching the bats come out, taking the kids there. So, you know, appreciate the attention towards the causeway, recognize the complexities of that landscape and of that transportation challenge. Really excited about the opportunities and, and Chris appreciated your comments, um, just reflecting on the, the bypass as wildlands because it is a really important part of our landscape. Uh, Christina and Autumn, thank you so much for your presentations and really excited to see you both coming into these roles and into the, the leadership that you're that you're taking on. So thank you. Um, I want to kind of to go back to where Christina started and thinking about investments coming into the region. And as we're all focusing here and now on transportation investments, um, there's a lot of other opportunities that are coming that have really strong tie-ins to, um, to transportation and to our infrastructure. Um, as we as we're thinking about where we want to go around um, clean and innovative infrastructure, as well as inclusive economy. So that's the opportunity I want to talk to you right now about, and I'm going to share my screen um, and just make just make because I know we're coming to the end of our time together. But the, there's a new opportunity coming out. It's called the Community Economic Resilience Fund. I hope you can all see my screen. Um, the Community Economic Resilience Fund is really highly aligned with what we're talking about today um, because it is a focus on inclusive economic and growth strategy well in addition to low carbon economy. So there's a lot of opportunities to take the types of conversations we're having right now and really think about um, adding in economic and workforce components as well as really leaning into the equity issues that we're talking about um, in order to create a, a more comprehensive strategy that really sees to all the different components of what we need to, trans, to transition to an inclusive and low carbon economy. So the Community Economic Resilience Fund or the SURF, it's a one-time use of American Rescue Act or, or American Rescue Plan Act funds uh, that will distribute $600 million across regions in California. So um, it's an opportunity for our region to, to kind of capture these investments in order to support this type of inclusive economic development planning. So what's the focus? I've already talked about the, the main focus, the inclusive and low carbon economic growth, um, but also want to note that there's a, they're looking really specifically at high quality jobs or high road jobs. These are really jobs that, um, that are, that represent inclusive pathways and are high quality jobs. And when the opportunity is there, unionized jobs to, to support this transition. And then they're also thinking really carefully um, as part of this funding opportunity about planning processes. And I'll talk a little bit more about this, but the, the first part of this opportunity is all about planning. And they really want to have both planning and implementation processes that focus on those who have been left out of traditional economic development strategy conversations. So really taking that idea of equity and, and, and leaning deeply into that for the planning processes and the outcomes of the implementation projects that we, uh, that we might pursue. So as part of this opportunity, the state has identified regions across the state. So that's, how they're, this, that's the organizing structure for the fund itself. So you can see here the Sacramento region has been identified by the state and it includes a seven county region. So it's a kind of our tr traditional six county SACOG um, planning region plus Calusa County. 
Um, and so it's possible, this is a relative, this is a very new program. They haven't even released the official guidance. So there might be some changes here, but their early guidance indicates that this is the region that they have identified for Sacramento. And just to kind of keep talking about some of the parameters of the programs and the way the state is thinking about this program is there is a, a strong focus on a regional approach. So early indications are that they are gonna look for single applications coming out of each region. And that's gonna call for a regional intermediary to help manage a local process um, related to advancing applications as part of this opportunity. So the role of this regional intermediary is to create an inclusive frame, a framework for engagement with partners, establish a decision-making structure or governance structure so that we can make decisions together as a region, serve as a lead coordinator for grant application processes, manage stakeholder roles and workflow, set sub-regional tables as needed. So for example, for our seven county region, Tahoe Basin will be a part of that. So I wanna make sure that we're really thinking about all the different components of our region, ranging from you know, the really rural communities to our Metro Sacramento, and then um, administer the grant and, dis and disperse funds um, as part of that process. There's a strong focus on inclusivity, which I've already noted, um, but this illustration here is just really about how do we bring everyone to the table and really think through carefully um, all the stakeholders that will be a part of this opportunity and part of this inclusive planning. So we've got community-based organizations, local jurisdictions, our regional institutions, labor, rural communities, employers, community members, elected officials. This, the, our governance structure, as we think through this as a region, is going to have to really integrate um, all these different stakeholders as, as we do this planning. So just to, uh, to really kind of lean into the excitement of what do we think surf dollars could do for our region and, and there's, there's a lot here. So I just pulled out one example um, because we're here talking about transportation, but one of the economic goals that our region has put forward is, is being um, kind of the, the hub in the nation or even the globe for innovative and clean mobility. So we've advanced the California Mobility Center as one example of where we've really said we want to put our we want to put our stake in the ground that, the, that we're the capital of Sacramento or we're the capital of California. California is really the most progressive state in the nation around adopting uh, low carbon and clean technologies, and we really think uh, that we have an opportunity to to be that place for advanced mobility. This is an opportunity to to really say not only how do we deliver on that, but how do we link that to equity goals that we have. So how do, how do we make that really real and alive in our historically under-resourced neighborhoods in, within Sacramento? How do we look out into the region, into rural communities and make sure that they're a part of that vision too? So this is, this is really a chance to, to regionalize that and, and make it really responsive to, uh, to really more immediate uh, recovery needs. So just an example, but but you know, the, I think the message I really want to deliver, this is a very transformational type of fund and a transformational opportunity for our region to think very strategically around big economic goals and then also really lean into equitable strategies um, to achieve them and to, and to set, a, set a really big table for this. So what's next? Like I said, this is really early in the process. The state is still working on their guidance. So they're planning on releasing their guidance um, for the planning part of the program, hopefully by the end of 2021. And then they'll be initiating an RFP process probably in the first quarter of 2022. So that's for planning grants. And I think they're uh, imagining about $5 million per region to support planning and capacity building. And then the implementation phase will begin in mid uh, 2022 that's the really competitive part where our region will be competing against uh, regions across the state to advance implementation projects for about the you know, $550 million that will remain in the fund at that, at that stage. So in terms of um, planning within the region itself, um, I, as part of Valley Vision, we have been uh, really doing a lot of outreach and learning sessions and listening sessions to start to get the word out about this opportunity and start to do that regional coordinating. Um, we're also working with our Prosperity Partnership. Our Prosperity Partnership is our, our group of organizations who um, have been working on the inclusive economic development roadmap that we have for the region. That's the prosperity strategy that really has the potential to be foundational um, as part of this opportunity. And that partnership includes SACOG, the Sacramento Metro Chamber, the Sacramento Asian Chamber, and the Greater Sacramento Economic Council, as well as Valley Vision. 
And then finally, we've been really active in communicating with our state leaders um, to make sure that the needs of our region are being heard. And um, even earlier in the process to make sure that, the, that this, this budget item was signed and, and approved and moving forward. So we're continuing to do that and, um, and make sure that, that we're really kind of staying in the mix as our state leadership is still guiding um, and crafting what this opportunity will be. How to stay engaged. We have a, um, a really brief form uh, that you can fill out. We're creating a, a listserv. We're gonna be doing listening sessions throughout January and maybe a little bit beyond. Um, so we're going to continue to be reaching out to people and looking for ways to engage people in this opportunity to, to organize the region. I'll put this link in the chat here in a minute um, so that you can either scan it with your phone with that QR code or you can go directly to the link on your computer. Um, but we are really excited to continue to engage with you. We think this is a great opportunity for the region. Um, there's certainly more to come as we learn more from the state, but we're starting to get organized now and um, want you to be a part of that too. So. That's all I have on that. Thanks for giving me time to talk about it and looking forward to further conversations and coordination. Thanks, Evan. And I, I see a comment from Richard Falcone with United Latinos. Uh, Richard, do you want to unmute yourself and maybe uh, speak to this or you want me to read it off? No, I, I, I can just brief it. It's there in the chat. Thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. And really, I got to tell you, this is really an honor to be here with all of you folks. Um, as I've seen a number, and I've been into a number of meetings where we talk about some of these strategies, especially for economic growth, especially we're starting to train uh, new, uh, new training and new workforce development, especially in the area of things related to climate change or, or, or whatever it might be along what we're talking. What I have seen, at least from the, uh, the, the more um, marginalized and underserved populations, especially those who are essential workers who have worked two or three jobs as parents, um, they are frequently left out of the mix. We focus on the youth and the youth training. Let's get the teenagers ready for this. Let's get those in their 20s ready for this. But there are people in their 40s and 50s who would just love the opportunity to advance themselves and to maybe move out of that two job, three job um, lifestyle that they are in into something that would then be really super sustainable for them and their families in the future. So I put that out there, uh, you know, as you think about this, as we go forward with these kind of opportunities, is not forgetting uh, not just Latino families, but just families who are low income, working multiple jobs, having childcare issues, and trying to provide for them the same opportunity as, as we would for others. Absolutely. Great comment and, and really glad, glad to see you, um, Richard. I think that that's just the opportunity that we have in front of us with, with the SURF. I think it's really about um, working like really robust community engagement processes to, um, to advance those types of inclusive workforce strategies. Um, so that's, that's, that's exactly what we're trying to do. And I also think, um, you know, there's a lot of great community organizing that's already going on. So this is an opportunity to support those entities that are doing that and, and kind of bring it all together into, into um, a more comprehensive strategy on behalf of the region. Yeah, yeah. As we, you know, many of us talk about a just transition being a, you know, goal as we move toward a, you know, low carbon economy, this seems like a real opportunity to do just that. So thank, thank you, Evan. Um, unfortunately, Susan, I see your hand raised. I do have to, to close things out, but uh, if you could just leave your comment in the chat, that would be wonderful. I appreciate it. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Uh, really, really enjoyed our conversation, focused on, on uh, regional infrastructure projects uh, across, across our area, but also in Yolo County, of course. Um, <laughs> really, really like that we were able to do a deep dive on that. Um, but really appreciate you all for participating today. Thank you to Valley Vision's Brittany Johnson. Brittany, you can give us a wave. Um, you did an excellent job managing the back end. Um, appreciate you. And of course, thanks to our fantastic lineup of speakers and experts and to our generous contributors uh, to the Cleaner Air Partnership for sponsoring this virtual luncheon. Um, I just wanted to plug a couple of things. Um, first of all, the Sacramento Metro Chamber of Commerce, um, they have their annual advocacy program, federal advocacy program known as Cap to Cap, uh, Capital to Capital. Um, their 50th anniversary of that program is actually happening this coming spring in Washington, D.C., fingers crossed. 
um, that that all will be well uh, by by the spring uh, with respect to COVID and in-person advocacy. Um, but that is taking place um, April 30th through May 4th. And I'm going to put a little link in the chat here. Boom. So you guys can check that out to learn a little bit more. Um, and again, that's if you're really interested in taking your federal advocacy uh, on air quality to the next level. Uh, last thing I'll say is I, I'm about to share uh, in the chat a link to a one minute evaluation of this luncheon where you can provide feedback on this luncheon, but also give us ideas for future luncheon topics that you might like to see us discuss. So I'm putting that in the chat now. So please hit that link before you hit the X uh, to close this Zoom call. Um, please do evaluate us. We, we value evaluation. We value evaluation. <laughs> Um, so uh, last but not least, the recording of this webinar will be available on Valley Vision's YouTube channel. Uh, and I will send you all a link to that via email early next week. Um, we'll look at the chat for any like helpful links, but if you want to, you know, make sure that something's included in that email to all the, the participants, just shoot that over to me via email um, and I'll and I'll try to add it. So um, hope you all enjoy your Friday afternoon. Keep, you can keep up with Valley Vision at valleyvision.org and, and enjoy your holidays, everybody.